excellent. So moving on to the second session, which I understand is live streaming right now. So uh, uh, is our friends and colleagues at DSN Forum who have been doing Facebook, all sorts of things on Facebook, uh, but in particular, uh, the brunch, uh, DSN Forum brunch, which we we're fortunate as Google Docs to be on as well. Uh, and so it's a great pleasure to have you guys um, uh, leading the second session. Uh, and I'm going to hand over to you to introduce your your guest speaker. So over to you, Amanda. Hello, welcome everybody. Welcome everybody online as well. Um, so my name is Amanda and I am a diabetes specialist nurse. I work in East Kent Hospitals. Um, and usually we're coming live brunch is usually done on Zoom. This is the first time ever we've done it actually live live with uh through the laptop i'm hoping that people can hear us um if not i apologize um and put any questions we have our becky tech support who is going to answer any questions from facebook um so please do send those in uh we're going to do a bit of a slido just because we want to get a word cloud going um this is the the link for slido so if you scan that um, we will we'll, we'll put that on in a second and I'll just introduce my colleagues and our special guest speaker so hello, I'm Beth Kelly I'm the diabetes specialist nurse in Wiltshire. Hi I'm Tamsin Fletcher Salt and I'm a diabetes specialist nurse at the Royal State University Hospital and our special guest. <laughs> I'm Rose Stewart and I'm a consultant clinical psychologist in the lead for diabetes psychology in Wales. Brilliant so let's press play and hopefully this works on the slide, eh? Cool. So first thing we want to ask, and um, do join in at home, the, the link is 20222 because 2022 is taken. <laughs> so I added an extra two to it just to make it easier. Um, so please join in. What does psychology mean to you? And we want a nice word cloud today. Um, hopefully Ooh. we'll start getting some things coming up. Rose will be psychoanalyzing all of us. <laughs> <laughs> Clever stuff, I like that. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. We'll give it a few minutes because Facebook's about a minute or so behind. <laughs> yeah. Is this the point where we go break into our girl bands? I would say support. support. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I would say support as well. Feelings. <laughs> so we can always open that up again once we um, once we uh, finish. You know, I'll open it while she's talking. Yeah, people, it's fine. people can add to it whilst whilst we're going. So the next question we just was trying to going to try and find out because I think psychology is quite um, difficult to get hold of in some places in the country. So we just want to try and get a, a show of hands, as it were as to how many people have a psychologist in their team or access to psychology as part of their team. So I'm just going to hopefully press play and hopefully that will come up. I don't. I don't know. Well, we, well, we kind of do slightly, but it's really, really hard to get into and yeah. the wait list is massive. But so, our paediatric team do have on the staff. Yeah. So it's really hard when they go through transition because they suddenly lose yeah, that. They, so they go into your level. It's so just when life's getting interesting. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we just lose it in your levels. And briefly, they allowed us to use it for like a year, mm -hmm. but then they withdrew it because obviously there was no money coming in from your levels. It was all being paid for by the peds. So, through it so yeah it's it's really tricky and yeah that is a story we hear over and over again i think you do get a lot more psychologists and pediatrics and part of that comes down to guidelines so you've got the ISPAD guidelines um for pediatrics and they are very very clear about recommending psychology there's nothing equivalent for adults so it's really difficult to get posts set up um and my post with young adults actually started on a pilot basis um, so i came into our diabetes team in wrexham can you not hear us <laughs> in um in 2016 um from a completely different team so i was part of a team that had been funded by welsh government money to reduce unscheduled care so we had three psychologists for the biggest health ward in wales and we had to reduce all unscheduled care 
no pressure. Um, so we initially stood at a and &E doors and thought we were to go away, and that didn't work. So then we started auditing the groups that were using unscheduled care most frequently. And the big, big groups that came out of that, we had COPD, we had people with medically unexplained symptoms, and we had young people with type 1 diabetes. So based on those audit figures, I was then parachuted into the young adult diabetes service in Wrexham, who at the same time had been asking for psychology. And we did a two-year pilot project to see what sort of effects it would have. So as well as giving people access to direct therapies, something that we started doing to begin with purely just to introduce me to the young people was having me sit in in clinic in the young adult service. And that started to work really, really well. And we learned sort of over time, because it came to a point where I had met everybody and the plan had been to withdraw me and sort of hide me away in the therapy room. But we realised it was working really well, that the clinics were becoming far more holistic. And it meant that all of our young adults were getting access to psychology and not just the ones who were in complete crisis. So at the end of the two years when we evaluated everything, we found that not only did we get very significant reductions in diabetes distress and fear of phobias, um, hypo issues, things like that. But then we started looking at our DKA data as well. And we found that when we looked at the DKA data, obviously we can't contribute all of it to psychology. Um, we found that our DKA admissions for young adults had gone down by 40% and our repeat DKAers there were none at the end of the project. So we had nobody having repeat DKA admissions. And of course, the beautiful thing with DKA data is that it's all costed. So Kate Anditario did that paper in 2014. So we know that each DKA costs on average £2,046. We worked out that the reduction covered my salary with 600 quid extra. <laughs> well, we bought a permanent me. <laughs> Um, so that got me a permanent job with the young adult service and then we had to start the massive campaign which was to have coverage across all of our three hospital sites and to extend it to all adults as well. Um, so that took five years of campaigning and then it got approved early this year so since July we've had a fully functioning service which is great and now we're sort of trying to go for Wales domination so yeah, it's getting there very slowly but yeah. We're all very jealous. Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. Our STP are just um, in the process of getting some psychology. But I think it's, it's even with the money, it's, is it difficult to recruit psychologists in, in areas? It can be. There's a workforce shortage, um, which is making things really difficult. So we don't train many clinical psychologists in the UK because it's expensive and it's hard. So clinical psychologists would have to do a three or four year undergrad course. Then you need to do at least two years of post-qualification experience. Then you have to apply to get onto the doctorate, which is one of the most competitive programmes in the country because you get paid to train. Um, to give the example of Wales, we train 30 a year, which is not very many. Do they have to stay in Wales? No. <laughs> <laughs> which is why we have a workforce shortage. Um, yeah, so we only train 30 a year in Wales, which isn't enough to even fill retirement gaps, let alone new posts that are coming up. There's been a lot of new posts coming up recently. Um, so a lot of COVID services cropping up all over the place, lots and lots of psychology input there. So it has been difficult, but there has been over the last couple of years, big, big investments. So the courses in England and Scotland have been doubling their numbers and Wales is expected to double their numbers in the next three years. Um, and what we're also getting are brand new posts called CAPS, which is Clinical Associate Psychologists. Oh, like yeah. Yay! So these are people at a master's level. Um, who would be then working under the supervision of the psychologist, but they would be able to take on some of the role. And they couldn't do sort of um, practicing independently, but it's one way around. Yeah, yeah. But perhaps after uh, David's, <laughs> but perhaps after David's talk, that actually these long COVID clinics, they're going to have a lot of people with diabetes in there, aren't they? So actually, perhaps diabetes could actually steal. <laughs> Still, some of us, I call it. Yeah, sure. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that's a nice, that's a word. Yes, thank you. Um, share these, these psychologists in their, in their teams, basically. Yeah. So 
I think the, the ultimate plan would be is that if we do find a magic, magic medication that fixes long COVID, take the long COVID psychologist, steal them for diabetes, and then we can all happy ever after. Oh, right. So, do we have any questions for Rose, or do you want to talk about your your books that, that came out first? Yeah, yeah, let's do that. Okay, let's do that. Okay. Um, but please do think of questions, and if you're on Facebook, please put your questions on here, and we'll read them out live. Um, so, as been beautifully modelled by Tanzia here um, in Wales, what we realised because of the massive, massive gaps in services is that we needed to do something we needed to develop resources that people could use if they couldn't get access to psychology um, and so as part of that we started writing the talking type one range so this is a range of guided self-help resources that we give out for free for people in wales um, so the first book was diabetes burnout then we have not so okay with needles for people with needle phobia then we started working on the kids range so we've got diabetes burnout for parents and carers and then we've got how to manage a mammoth which is our children's book um and the next one that's coming out well came out in wales this week is adjusting to life with diabetes so that's for newly diagnosed people and that's going on to the national pathway for newly diagnosed people with type 1 so that's really exciting that it's starting to be integrated into mainstream because what we're really pushing for now in Wales is a sort of full stepped care pyramid of psychological support for people. So actually seeing a psychologist, if you think about sort of the, the levels of distress that people would have, I'm quite high up there because I'm an expensive resource. And so that is something that we cannot give to everybody. So what we need is a whole wealth of resources at lower levels. And that's where things like these books come in. But what we also need are training resources for staff because DSMs in particular, you guys see these people so much and you're the people who end up supporting a lot of these people in distress. I was just going to say, how what kind of things would you recommend to DSMs to go for? I know you told me about a course that I went and did, which is really helpful. Obviously, everyone can't access things like that either. So are there any things that DSNs or GPs or whatever can go to that might give us a little bit of training or learning, not so where it's awesome as you, but just have something in our toolbox that we can perhaps help people Yeah, with. there's quite a few programmes out there. and I think you can sort of do them at different levels. It depends how deep you want to go into it, really. Um, so the CDEP training programme has got modules for emotional health in there. Um, some of the diabetes master's courses, so the Swansea course, for example, I'm a tutor on that, so you get quite a lot of psychological input there. Um, diabetes UK have got an emotional wellbeing module, so there's a sort of 45 minute video that you can watch. If you want to go further than that, on again on the DEK website, they've got this amazing book that is so helpful that it's 300 pages long, which I think freaks people out slightly. Um, but that's adapted from um, Australia, where they're quite far ahead of us in terms of diabetes psychology. And that gives you sort of screening tools, interventions, pathway plans um, for the really common psychological issues. So things like your diabetes distress, your fear of hypos, um, that's covered on there. So that's really worth going into. Um, then if people want to sort of really think about going to the next level, looking at things like maybe a CBT course or ACT for Physical Health is a really good one that you can do. So that's acceptance and commitment therapy and act as something called a third wave therapy, which is kind of where we're at in terms of therapies at the moment. So I know a while ago, everyone got a bit obsessed with CBT. And one of the reasons is that it really lends itself to randomized control trials. And so we got a really good research base. And so everyone started training in it. We don't do CBT anymore. That's That's gone by the wayside quite a long time ago, especially in physical health. So we're looking a lot more at things like acceptance and commitment therapy and compassion focused therapy. These seem to be really fitting people with physical health issues. I think it's, um, really important to remember if you're working in diabetes as well because when you look at things like the nice guidance it's talking about issues like anxiety and depression and yeah we know people with diabetes are 50 percent more likely to experience those 
But you've also got to remember that diabetes calls its own psychological stuff. So diabetes distress, needle failure in people with type 1, type 1 disordered eating, fear of hypos, these are really specialist issues. And so often if you send people with diabetes off to generic mental health services when they've got these really specialist diabetes things going on, the therapist will say, well, I'd love to support you, but I don't understand what you're going through. And quite often people come back either having had no support or the wrong kind of support. The number of young people I've worked with who had to sit through self-help anorexia programs when they don't have anorexia, they've got type 1 disordered eating, it's completely different. And that risks actually making people worse sometimes. So I think it's really important to recognise that not only have we got people who are a lot more vulnerable just because of all the added crap that diabetes puts into your life, but it's this specialist stuff that just doesn't get recognised. And because it's not officially recognised, it's not in the DSM, it's not in the ICD-10, People just think this stuff doesn't exist, but it absolutely does. And when we look at the research, when we look at diabetes distress, because there was a lot of conversation about, well, is this just depression a long time ago? But actually, diabetes distress is independent from this. This is something that only people with diabetes get. We need a specialist understanding and a specialist workforce for it. Because I think, um, yeah, I think, you know, like things like diabetes burnout kind of comes and goes, mm -hmm. you know, in a sense that, you know, people, if you suffer from depression, you tend to be at risk of depression in a sense, mm -hmm. whereas diabetes burnout, you know, people go through it and then can come out the other side and be kind of fine in a sense mm -hmm. with their diabetes, but, you know, but then something happens that with that, you know, with life generally with diabetes anyway, and then that makes them struggle with their diabetes. So it's, it's a very niche kind of area, isn't it? And I, and I suppose it's, um, you know, maybe generally out in the populace, it's not always kind of known about really. Mm. Um, people don't necessarily understand, you know, how hard diabetes is to live with on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, we don't have that break from it ever, really. Yeah. Absolutely. It's, yeah, it's 180 minimum decisions on top of just all of the daily life things that people have to go through and that puts a tremendous strain on people but I think it's it's not just the general population not understanding it's also diabetes care systems not understanding mm -hmm. because quite often when you look at the research on these kinds of things it's with the greatest of respect to my colleagues um when you go sort of back through history and we recently um, did a systematic review on repeat DKA and the predictors of that. And actually, it makes a massive difference, the professional group of the person who's writing that paper. So, so often it's been very enthusiastic, <laughs> but ultimately quite misguided medical students writing these papers with very limited understanding of the psychological processes. There are still papers being published today calling people neurotic for having repeat DKAs. <laughs> And this sort of starts to proliferate into our research base. So quite often we've got these studies that are finding that there's no significant impact of psychological intervention when the people who are planning and delivering those interventions in the studies didn't know the first thing, were not trained to sort this. And I've been um, sitting in on review panels recently because the um, government in Scotland are reviewing their guidance for diabetes psychology. And the outcome for the reviews that they were looking at was all HbA1c. So we're not even thinking about, does this reduce distress? Does this reduce admissions? It's just HbA1c. Daphne was listed as a psychological intervention. That was more It's the same with tech. We're, we're busy giving everybody tech, and it is amazing, and I'm very pro-tech, but also the cons of tech and the alarm fatigue and just all the added extra stuff that comes with that and body image and all that kind of stuff but yeah we're not very good at thinking about the, the cons all the time yeah yeah absolutely i think as a general care system and you can see sort of how it happens there's always so much to keep on top of there's always so much to learn that it's quite easy to forget that the human connection that we have with our patients is actually one of the most important things that we have in our toolbox and so often it's 
really sad to say that actually quite often the diabetes care system is actively harming people. We've got people who have been traumatised by some of their clinic appointments or the care that they've had from people. And that takes so long to undo. It's so difficult because when you have those sorts of experience and young adults are notorious for this, they, they feel like they've been told off. So they decide to solve that and then go back again. And then you only catch them seven years later and they're starting to develop complications. So we really need as a care system this upskilling all over the care system. This isn't just about sort of having nice books to give to people. This is about making sure, first and foremost, that we're not actually doing anybody any harm because it's so easy to do. It really is. Yeah. Is that what your new... <laughs> project so that's a nice it's a nice. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah so this got launched in wales um earlier this week so this um is not a book this is a um this is our big grand scheme for diabetes psychology in wales because there's never been any published national guidance for diabetes psychology at all ever in the world um so we thought, well, we've got to start somewhere, and that's what this is all about. So this document is about, firstly, it's basically giving teams the ammunition they need to get business cases through. So it's looking at things like the evidence base, it's looking at key performance indicators, it's got pathways for distress, for time, for repeat DKA, it's got workforce recommendations for the first time. So we've stated and we've sort of matched to somewhere between renal and cystic fibrosis workforce recommendations. So we're saying that the minimum standard is one full-time psychologist per 600 patients with type one. And the gold standard, which is what we should be aiming for for all young adult services, is one full-time per 375, which sounds a lot, but I can guarantee you if you get anywhere close to that, the benefits that will come not just to patients, but to the care system as a whole will be dramatic. It makes such a big difference to the way that teams work. And then if you've got a psychologist, so unlike your poor psychologist, Tamsin, who only had a tiny, tiny slither of time, and we see this over and over again, people with an enormous population and they've only got half a day. You can't expect people to actually run a functioning service on that. But if we actually have a workforce that's got the resources, that's got the time, and this is what I've been able to do in my job because I'm full time, this is when you get shiny books. This is when you get research projects. This is when you get sort of national planning. So I think it's really important to recognise that actually you need to give people the time to do their jobs properly because then you get so much more value from it. So Wales have done it, Scotland are doing it, mm -hmm. not England anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, England. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. England seems different. Mm -hmm. England has IAPT, which has varying degrees of success. So you have some IAMP services where you've got clinical psychologists in there, they're providing supervision, they're running the show, um, and that seems to work quite well. Then you've got other services where it's not working so well. Um, one of the things I would really, really say is that if you do have access to an IAMP service that are offering long-term condition support, insist that they integrate with your diabetes team. You want them in the building as much as you possibly can because that gives you far easier access to them and it also ensures that they are upskilling because I have um, had communications from people with IAPS. So this was um, an IAPS service that's calling it specialist in diabetes. So this is a specialist di diabetes IAPS service They'd have three days of long-term condition training and one day on diabetes, and that's a specialist service. So you need to have them in the building. If you integrate your psychologist or your IAPT service, that has a much, much better effect. And there's um, a team that I think they won the QIC awards in 2019, I think 2019 or 2020, 
um, by integrating IAP. So that's a case study on the QIC website. So it's really worth looking at and finding ways to do that because that has far, far better effects that way. Um, but yeah, it's it's tricky in England if you've got clinical commissioning groups and things yeah. like that. So even if you did come out on a national basis and say this is what we expect, actually getting it through is a lot harder. Yeah, just leave it away. I'm quite close. Yeah. <laughs> do I act just do CBT? Because we had some IAPs people in our team, and I'm sure they only did CBT though. But I might be making that up. There's different levels of IAPs workers. So you've got at the sort of baseline level, you've got psychological well-being practitioners. They're all trained in CBT, and so they will do a lot of your anxiety and depression work. And they might do a bit of, sort of generic coping with the long-term condition type stuff. Then you've got high intensity practitioners. And so these are quite often practitioners who've done additional training. So they might have done things like EMDR or ACT or CFT, but it's all matched to levels of need. And quite often the long-term condition stuff is just those lower level PWP posts. You do get some really really good PWPs. I'm as a PWP, I'm not knocking them. Um, so you do get them, but it's it's difficult. I think you need them in your service so then you can know that they're trained, you know they know their stuff, and you know that if something starts going wrong and someone rocks up with ketones or a hypo, that they're going to come and get you. Yeah. It's important. We take, Sorry. We take the mic like over. Really simple one. Yeah. What's a PWP? Psychological wellbeing practitioner. Thank you. Uh, forgive me, I'm from England. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have things like that. So these are generally people who've done a psychology degree, and then they'll have been on a specialist PWP training course, and then they can practice. So can I just, uh, am I allowed to interrupt? Yeah. yeah. Um, just a question, you, you spoke of this tremendous benefit for people with DKA. Do you know how long that lasts? I mean, do you have, is this a, a one intervention and they are fixed for the next five years? Or is this an ongoing, constant input? That is a difficult question to answer because when we think about the things that predict DKA, so we recently reviewed this and we found young, female, psychological issues, poverty. Those are the four big predictors. So all we need to do is take those things away. Like yeah. get rid of poverty. Stop them being female and young. Well, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We fix the lap first, though. Yeah. Stop them being young. Um, so it's, it's yeah. Um, <laughs> and the psychological issue one, again, it's quite difficult to unpick. So in our service, for example, we've certainly had um, people that I've worked with who were repeat DKs. It was unmet, sort of unmanaged diabetes distress, just general sort of psychological burden of it. When they got the support, they stopped. So there's young, one young man in my service, um, and I'm allowed to say this because he's talked publicly about this. Yeah, lovely Chris. He was in and out of DK all of the time. Um, and then we worked with him. He didn't want to come and see me. I stalked him. I chased him down. I made him come and see me. Um, we worked through all of the various issues that were going on for him. He is now doing amazingly. He's on a pump. His HbA1c is in a really good place and he's now a student nurse. So he's completely turned his life around. Now you get other people where there's a lot of other stuff going on. So these might be people with trauma issues. These might be people who've got abuse going on in their lives, people with drug problems, people who are homeless. And their psychological issues, they're definitely there, but actually their lives are so chaotic. They're so difficult. And these are people where you quite often sit in front of them and you think, well, if you didn't have type one, you'd probably be in here overdosing or self-harming. Those people, you can do a lot of really good work with, but quite often, even after you do that work, they're going back into such a chaotic, difficult system that the best you might hope for is just a, a reduction or for things to stay more stable. So it's, it's a difficult one. I think a huge proportion of the repeat DKA numbers, if we could go back in time and sort of assess them all again, you would find an enormous level of undiagnosed type 1 disordered eating. That would be a massive, massive component of it. And we are starting to 
understand a lot more about tide now and there are papers coming out about tide so the study project is now publishing um formulations and papers on tide and yes yesterday or the day before yesterday the mead guidance came out so this is replacing marzipan so i've forgotten already what mead stands for something like medical emergencies and eating disorders yeah um, and there is an explicit chapter on type 1 disordered eating for the first time ever. So that's really, really important. So that's definitely worth looking at. So things are starting to shift slightly with our understanding. But yes, so many of these repeat DKAs, it's on that psychological need that's just never been addressed. So I do have some questions. <laughs> um, so you can ask questions either on Slido uh, using that code 20222. Or if you're watching us from home on Facebook, you can, you can ask questions there. Becky is doing the live feed and I'm not being rude on my phone. I am. <laughs> doing 20 things at once, multitasking. Um, so we have, yeah. <laughs> um, right, so I think you've, you've kind of explained this quite a lot already, but um, diabetes burnout, is there anything you want to add? So when we think about certain issues with diabetes, the fundamental sort of cornerstone of all of that is diabetes distress. Um, but really simply, diabetes distress is basically a metric of how much do you hate your diabetes at the moment. So you can imagine that if people have very high diabetes distress, they're not going to want to look after it. They're going to feel stressed out, exhausted, hating it all of the time. And when you get diabetes distress that goes unmanaged and feels sort of a bit relentless for a period of time, then people get into this place of burnout where you just get to a place where you feel like I cannot diabetes anymore. Thank you very much. And I'm going to stop now. And that stopping looks different for different people. So it might be that you just feel like I'm done with carb counting. I'm just going to do my amazing guessing, which a lot of my young people do. And their amazing guessing is not amazing. <laughs> um, but bless them, they try. And interestingly, um, yeah, a lot of them stop blood glucose monitoring again. And a lot of them will say, well, I know what my bloods are. But really interesting, there's actually studies on this that show that the more psychologically distressed you are, the worse your radar for your bloods is. Um, and it's always the really distressed ones that stop blood glucose monitoring. So yeah, we've got, so there'll be young adults who haven't tested their bloods since sort of six months plus, unless they felt really ropey. So it's that sort of diabetes distress plus a reduction in how you look after your diabetes. That's when we get to diabetes burnout. Okay, right. We have another question. Does Rose work with young people living with type 2 or monogenic diabetes? And if so, are the same therapies or approaches used? Yeah, we do have people with type 2 in our service. Um, it depends on what's going on for them, really. So quite often, thinking about some of the young people with type 2 I've worked with, it's been about sort of thinking about stigma, shame, because it's a huge issue in type 2 diabetes, self-concept, and sort of because these people were at a point where they were just going on to metformin. Um, so it was thinking about, okay, well, how can we still work with lifestyle factors for you? But it was general distress about it in a really big way. Um, we've had some really rare forms of diabetes um, diagnosed in our clinic. And so with those cases, it's just, um, this is one young person who's got a Wolfram syndrome. So it's supporting him around that and um, all of the issues that it's currently causing and is likely to cause in the future. So with some of them, it's not so much about sort of actively working on one particular issue. With some of them, it's just trying to keep them steady and trying to stop them from going off the rails. Um, so yeah, we basically, anything that our diabetes and endocrinology consultants see, I will see as well because I'm attached to the team. I think we've got a question from Kevin. Do you want a mic or? No, just a quick one. Hey, what about maybe slightly older patients? Mm -hmm. 40s, 50s, with living with type 2 diabetes? Any tips or any resources? Because with, there's a lot of complex you know, psychosocial interplay there. Yeah, yeah. And the stigma, you know, and that's driven by the media as well, diabetes shaming. 
So that's something I'm really struggling with mm -hmm. my own patients living with type 2 diabetes after the older population. Any any signposting there? Yeah, not signposting currently. No, but, 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 um, yeah, there's a project that we're getting involved with that could potentially be quite useful for that. Um, because I think in terms of diabetes psychology, that it's a wide open field. There is so much low-hanging fruit up for grabs here. <laughs> Um, so yeah, any future psychologists listening, this is a really good field to be in. Um, I think there is massive scope to look at things like computerized therapy programs that you can make widely accessible. And there are, I get lots of sort of requests from people who are looking at things like developing apps and developing online programs. I think there's a massive and very easy win potentially in those. Um, so yeah, they are under development, they will happen at some point. I just wanted to come up so on that bit about digitalizing psychology services. Is there much evidence at the moment, or is that something that's appreciated by PODs and, and that side of things, and also group therapy in this setting? What's the situation with that? Can we just repeat that on the mic? So yeah, the home here. Yeah. <laughs> so the question was about digital therapy and whether there's much evidence for that, and then group therapy as well. Um, so in terms of digital therapy, obviously during COVID and lockdown, a lot of people went online. Um, we kept our young adult service going face to face all the way through because we decided the risks of them dropping out completely outweighed the risks and because we had ones where we could distance and keep it all safe. Um, we kept it going. We gave our young people the option if they wanted to do face to face or virtual. Overwhelmingly, they chose face to face um, because I think when you're talking about difficult personal things, you want a human there. Um, however, having access to things like teams and being able to do, uh, we use attend anywhere as well. That's been a game changer for our university students. So we've got young people who've stayed under our service, but they've gone off to Liverpool or Glasgow or wherever. And it's meant that I can keep seeing them on a weekly basis, which has been incredibly useful. So I think it's not an either or, I think it's a both. Um, and in terms of group work, yeah, you can get some really good results. There's some really interesting stuff coming out of New Zealand um, about compassion-focused therapy groups, and they seem to have a really, really big impact. So I think we could do some lovely, lovely groups. Um, you could have things like newly diagnosed groups. So I know in Ireland, um, they've been doing um, therapy groups with the Mammoth Book, where they get kids to draw pictures of their own diabetes animals and things like that. Um, and then I know there are therapy groups that are starting up newly diagnosed people where they're going to be using our, the new diagnosis book as well. So I think, yeah, there's a lot of scope for that. Yeah. All right, we have one minute left. So I'm going to let you pick the question out of the loads and loads of questions that we have. The rest of them, we will put the answers on the Facebook on, underneath the live stream. Okay, this one, go on then. So, is there any recognition that mental health or psychological support needs may change during a person's life? For example, diagnosis of complications and pregnancy concerns? Absolutely, yes. Um, if you think back through your own life, have there been times when you've been acutely stressed? Yes, did the acute stress wane? Yeah, we, we don't just stay the same for our whole lives. Having a baby is so flipping stressful. Um, and especially if you are someone with type one, when you've been under the pregnancy team and they are all over you, all the way through pregnancy, and then the baby comes out, your life gets significantly more stressful and the team disappears. So yeah, no, there absolutely is evidence for this. We know that young adults have particularly high levels of distress because they're working out who they are in the world and their brains aren't quite developed yet and they do loads of stupid stuff. Um, and then, yeah, as we go through life, any sort of big life events, so changing jobs, moving house, getting divorced, being bereaved, all of these things sort of trigger off this stress. And sometimes we are in a place where we can contain that stress. And sometimes actually there was quite a lot of other stuff going on. And we just, yeah, we fall apart. So definitely changes over time. Just had a message from Amber. It said we can have a few more minutes if you want to answer one more. Needle <laughs> 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 Okay, so someone's asked me how common needle failure is. Yeah, it's out there. 
very much out there. Um, so I work with a lot of people with needle phobia and that presents in lots of different ways. So it might be that they need to get somebody else to inject them. It might be that they really struggle to put on their Libra sensors. I've got a young person who can only do it. Well, it, it was the strategy that we decided she was going to use, but she stuck with it. She can only do a sensor change while singing the theme tune to SpongeBob to work on it. <laughs> and we'll write that up again, <laughs> <Jen. laughs> Um so, but quite often with um, people with type 1, especially if they've had needle phobias and type 1 since childhood, interestingly, it's quite often about trauma. So a lot of them will recount sort of really scary experiences like being held down by nurses because they didn't want to do their injections. That will give you a phobia, my friend. <laughs> um, so yeah, for some people, we do sort of exposure work where it's sort of building up to the point where they feel that they can inject and sometimes that involves watching me having blood drawn and stuff I suffer that one. I really do um sometimes if it's a very big trauma underlying thing we get to do the magic EMDR therapy which is eye movement desensitization and reprocessing is very cool um so yeah it's it's out there it's common and it just has catastrophic effects for some people we've had people we've had massive decay admissions because they couldn't bring really themselves to inject i think that probably brings us to an end thank you so much ray thank you to everybody that joined us in person and online we do have loads and loads of questions and i will try and get all the answers for you um, in the break so most things she's going for coffee <laughs> <laughs> she's having a we'll get you a coffee right we'll get you a coffee while you answer all the questions <laughs> That's great. Thank you so much. That was an excellent session. Thanks, guys.